In the realm of horror films, Michael Myers from the Halloween series is a character that has left an indelible impression. Created by John Carpenter and known as The Shape, Myers is more than just a human antagonist. He's the embodiment of pure, inexplicable evil. His emotionless demeanor and trail of bloody chaos have been haunting audiences worldwide since his debut in Halloween back in 1978. He emerged from anonymity to become an iconic symbol of death that neither rationalizes nor avoids. In this video, we'll explore Myers' psychology, his terrifying symbolism, and the social commentary woven into his character. We'll also examine what makes him unique among horror movie villains and secures his place as one of the genre's most fearsome and enduring figures. The fear surrounding Myers originates from a chilling origin story. Born in Haddonfield, Illinois, a seemingly average suburban town, Michael was a normal child until Halloween night, 1963, when he committed his first murder. At only six years old, he brutally killed his teenage sister Judith without any apparent motive, an event that launched one of horror's most iconic stories. It wasn't revenge or jealousy or rage that motivated him. It was something far darker, a soulless emptiness. What makes Myers so frightening from the outset is the complete lack of reasoning behind his actions. Unlike other horror villains who often have tragic backstories or psychological triggers for their descent into madness, Michael's evilness lacks explanation. He isn't a product of abuse or burdened with a traumatic history. He simply personifies pure evil. This absence of motive makes him unpredictable, unrelatable, and inscrutable. After the murder, Michael was institutionalized at Smith's Grove Sanitarium under Dr. Samuel Loomis's care, one of the series' main characters, who provides insight into Michael's nature. After years of trying to reach the boy, Loomis concluded that Michael was more than a disturbed child. He was something far more sinister. In his words, Michael is purely and simply evil a statement that echoed throughout the series and significantly contributed to the character's mythology. The true horror of Myers lies in his complete lack of humanity. He's a blank slate, devoid of emotion or speech, expressionless. His silence, empty gaze, and deliberate movements suggest a mind operating outside normal psychological boundaries. Often compared to an unstoppable force of nature, a fitting analogy, Michael exists without reason or purpose. He just is. Understanding him is futile because there's nothing to understand. Dr. Loomis's repeated description of Michael as the boogeyman solidifies this idea. He isn't driven by desire or anger or even hatred. He personifies death itself, a predator whose sole instinct is killing. There's no satisfaction derived from his actions. He doesn't stalk his victims for revenge, nor does he revel in their suffering. He kills because it's all he knows how to do. This absence of motive, any psychological depth beyond primal destruction makes him even more horrifying. This concept of pure evil plays a crucial role in maintaining Michael's horror appeal. He isn't human like other killers are. While characters like Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees are rooted in human experiences, whether it's vengeance, trauma, or sadism, Michael surpasses these constraints. His mind is an abyss and it's this void that incites fear. Humans fear what they don't know, and Michael Myers embodies this unknown element. The mask he wears only heightens his anonymity. Behind the mask isn't a man, but a void. Darkness staring right back at us. The mask of Michael Myers is more than just a prop. It's an essential part of his character. The blank white face with hollow eyes erases any trace of humanity, transforming him into a nearly abstract entity known as the Shape. This wasn't an accidental choice by John Carpenter. By removing his individuality, the mask turns Michael into a universal representation of fear, a figure onto which viewers can cast their darkest worries. He becomes more than just another man. He's now an undefined shape lurking in the shadows, a constant threat that could appear anywhere at any time. This absence of identifiable traits adds to the terror by stripping Michael of his humanity. He isn't just a man committing murders. He goes beyond human categorization entirely. His mask changes him into a symbol of death, an abstract embodiment of fear itself. In this context, Michael Myers becomes a modern Grim Reaper, a silent figure whose presence means impending doom. The Halloween franchise, 
particularly its first 1978 film, serves not only as horror, but also as commentary on suburban America's misguided sense of safety. Haddonfield is portrayed as an idyllic community where tragedy is virtually unknown, a perfect setting for Michael Myers' reign of terror. In many ways, Michael represents the hidden darkness beneath suburban America's surface. He emerges from within this community, born and raised in an average family and home. His transformation into a killer is sudden and unexplained, as if his inherent evil was always there, waiting to be unleashed. This taps into a wider cultural fear, the potential hidden dangers in even the safest places. Michael isn't an outsider invading Haddonfield, he's a product of it. The theme of suburban vulnerability is further emphasized by his victims, often innocent teenagers. Laurie Strode, as the typical final girl, represents the wholesome all-American girl next door. But even she isn't safe from Michael's wrath. His ability to violate domestic sanctity, especially when suburban America was seen as the epitome of safety, heightens the horror. Moreover, Michael Myers' character reflects societal worries about crumbling traditional values. The late 1970s, the time when Halloween first appeared, was a period of significant social change with shifting attitudes toward family dynamics, sexuality, and authority figures. Michael's violent rampage against Haddonfield's seemingly virtuous teens can be seen as symbolic punishment for their perceived sins, especially their sexual activities. The Halloween franchise, like its successor Friday the 13th series, plays on this era's moral panic, presenting Michael as a puritanical figure passing judgment. What sets Michael Myers apart from other horror villains is the inherent terror he represents. Unlike many antagonists in this genre, who have their own backstories or personal motivations, Michael goes beyond these constraints. He's not on a revenge mission or driven by any noticeable emotion or ambition. Instead, he's an unstoppable force, an embodiment of death that resists any logical explanation or end. This unique feature makes Michael particularly terrifying. He isn't bound by human rules, nor does he adhere to the psychological patterns often seen in serial killers. His murders lack reason, and his own mortality seems non-existent. In Halloween, despite being shot multiple times and falling from a two-story window, Michael simply disappears, as if he exists beyond the physical world. This sense of invulnerability recurs throughout the series as he survives fatal injuries over and over again. His apparent immortality remains a mystery and adds to the legend that he's more than just a man. He's a supernatural embodiment of evil. Unlike Freddy Krueger, who is known for his taunts and jokes, Michael never speaks. This lack of speech is unsettling because it removes any chance of understanding or empathizing with him. Without dialogue or even simple sounds, Michael appears more like a ghost and less like a human. His slow, deliberate movements also add to his terror factor. Even in chaotic situations, Michael remains calm. While his victims may run away in fear, or fight back in desperation, Michael stays composed and methodical. This persistent pursuit taps into our primal fear, the horror of being chased by something unstoppable. No matter how fast his victims run, Michael always catches up with them. Michael Myers' place in horror history isn't just due to his high body count, but also because of the deep themes he represents. He goes beyond the typical slasher villain. He's the embodiment of pure evil, a symbolic representation of death that has been scaring audiences for over 40 years. Unlike other horror villains whose motives are linked to specific past events or traumatic experiences, Michael remains an enigma. This allows viewers to project their own fears onto him. This is why he has remained relevant for so long, because he taps into our universal fear of the unknown. As the Halloween franchise has evolved, so too has the mythology surrounding Michael. The original film portrayed him as a seemingly ordinary man with extraordinary evil within. Later films emphasized his supernatural qualities, portraying him as a nearly invincible force of nature. But despite these character developments, Michael Myers' essence remains the same. He's a shadowy figure, an unstoppable killer who embodies our deepest fears. Few characters in horror cinema are as intimidating or iconic as Michael Myers. He goes beyond human identity. He's a force representing death and terror, 
that defies understanding or ending. His blank mask, silence and slow movements make him a figure of pure terror, an abstract representation of the malevolent forces hidden within us all. As long as we fear the unknown, death and the darkness lurking just outside our safe suburban streets, Michael Myers will continue to haunt our collective imagination. He isn't just a character in a movie. He's the shape that haunts our nightmares, the faceless embodiment of evil staring back at us from the darkness. It's this timeless terror that cements Michael Myers' place as one of history's most frightening figures in horror cinema. Rising from the depths of Crystal Lake, Jason Voorhees has become a symbol of terror. This relentless killer, with his iconic hockey mask and machete stained with blood, has left a lasting impact on both cinema and the nightmares of viewers. Jason isn't just a villain. He represents pure, unfiltered fear. His presence is a mystery that defies understanding, signifying not just a series of brutal murders, but the embodiment of dread itself. This analysis seeks to delve into Jason's psyche, his symbolism, and his influence on the horror genre. To understand Jason Voorhees, we need to explore the tragic events that shaped him. Born to Pamela Voorhees, Jason was a mentally challenged child who was subjected to ridicule at Camp Crystal Lake. His physical deformity and social isolation made him an easy target for bullying, a representation of society's broader hostility toward those deemed different. In the first Friday the 13th movie, we learn that negligent camp counselors allowed Jason to drown in the lake, an event that marks a turning point in his story, one filled with abandonment and death that would later drive his reign of terror. Jason's mental state can be traced back to this initial trauma. At his core, he is a tormented spirit, trapped within a body turned into an instrument of revenge. His drowning, caused by neglect, triggered rage in his mother, Pamela, who became the franchise's first killer seeking justice for her son's death by killing negligent counselors. After Pamela's death by one of the surviving girls, Jason picks up her mission of revenge. Therefore, Jason isn't just an aimless murderer, he is carrying forward his mother's grief-driven killing spree. Traditional horror films, like Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street, often have clear psychological profiles. Michael Myers represents pure evil, while Freddy Krueger embodies nightmares and sadism with his dark humor. Jason Voorhees is more complex, a primal force driven by instinct and an unrelenting need for revenge. Jason's mental state is deeply rooted in trauma and abandonment. His childhood was tainted by physical deformity, bullying, and neglect. When he drowned, it seemed as if the world that had already rejected him had sealed his destiny. His return as a murderous adult symbolizes the ultimate betrayal. Each person he kills represents the counselors who neglected him. Each murder is a reminder of his unresolved pain. Jason's murders are not personal. They are indiscriminate yet symbolic acts of revenge against a world that failed him. What makes Jason truly terrifying is his lack of humanity. Unlike Freddy Krueger, who takes pleasure in tormenting his victims, Jason remains silent. His face hidden behind a hockey mask conveys nothing but death, an emotionless abyss. He doesn't kill out of enjoyment or cruelty, but due to an unstoppable primal urge, a raw instinct devoid of morality, empathy, and reason. This lack of emotion is highlighted by Jason's physical presence. He moves slowly, yet deliberately, with an air of inevitability. No matter how far victims run, or how well they hide, Jason always catches up to them. At its core, Friday the 13th provides social commentary on the dangers of youthful recklessness, particularly regarding premarital sex, drug use, and irresponsible behavior. From the beginning, Jason's victims are often young and carefree, traits that make them vulnerable to his deadly form of justice. The counselors at Camp Crystal Lake pay for their negligence, a theme echoed throughout the series. In several ways, Jason acts as a strict enforcer punishing sexual transgressions or drug use. The final girl trope, the single female survivor who is typically more virtuous than her peers, fits this narrative perfectly. However, this simple view of Jason as a punisher is complicated by his status as a victim of societal cruelty. His disfigurement, isolation, and eventual death are the result of society's abuse. Thus, 
Jason is both a victim and a monster, a tragic figure whose actions reflect the very society that created him. His anger isn't just aimed at individuals, but at the world that rejected him. So, Jason isn't merely a killer. He represents the consequences of exclusion and neglect. The hockey mask, worn by Jason Voorhees, is an iconic symbol in horror films. It transforms a simple piece of sports gear into a terrifying emblem, erasing any signs of humanity from his face and replacing them with an unreadable exterior. The mask isn't just a prop. It's a visual representation of Jason's character, embodying the impersonal essence of fear itself. By hiding his features, the filmmakers remove his identity, turning him into an agent of chaos rather than a man. The mask also grants Jason anonymity. Unlike Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers, characters whose unique backgrounds are key to their identities, Jason isn't tied to any specific persona. His mask allows him to be anyone or no one at all. He is both omnipresent and elusive, a constant presence of horror that can strike at any moment. This anonymous nature is key to his lasting appeal. The hockey mask also emphasizes the dehumanization in Jason's character development. He's no longer the deformed boy who was mocked and rejected. He's become an emotionless void without empathy or individuality. His transformation from a young outcast into a silent masked murderer reflects his loss of humanity. Among horror villains, Jason Voorhees stands out for various reasons, most notably due to his contradictory nature. He's both a pitiful victim and a terrifying antagonist. Unlike other horror icons driven by personal vendettas or sadistic pleasure, Jason is motivated by more primal emotions like raw anger and grief. Another distinct feature is his physical prowess. While characters like Freddy Krueger have supernatural abilities and Michael Myers represents psychological terror, Jason is physically formidable. His brute strength presents a unique threat. He doesn't need to sneak up on victims. He can simply follow them at his own pace, knowing he'll eventually catch up. Jason's longevity in the genre shows his adaptability. Over numerous films, he has evolved from a vengeful spirit to an undead killing machine, even venturing into science fiction in Jason X. Despite these changes, his unyielding quest for revenge remains constant. Audiences are drawn to Jason because he represents a universal fear, being chased by an unstoppable force. Jason Voorhees has left a lasting mark on horror history as more than just another serial killer. He personifies our deepest fears, the fear of death, the unknown, and the consequences of our actions. Although he's a tragic figure, a product of neglect and cruelty, he surpasses his backstory, becoming something much more horrifying. In the world of horror, where many killers rely on gimmicks or complex backstories, Jason stands out for his simplicity. He doesn't need elaborate traps or supernatural abilities to instill fear. His mere presence is enough. And it's this presence, a relentless, unstoppable entity, that ensures Jason Voorhees will remain one of the most iconic and frightening figures in horror cinema for years to come. In horror literature and film, Pennywise the Dancing Clown is an extraordinarily unsettling, omnipresent, and multifaceted antagonist. This character first appeared in Stephen King's 1986 novel It, and has since been immortalized in the 1990 miniseries and the 2017 and 2019 film adaptations. However, Pennywise is more than a singular entity of fear. He embodies a force that transcends time, shape, and even terror itself. He's not just a clown, but an ancient cosmic being that feeds on humanity's darkest aspects, primarily fear. Pennywise's distinct allure and horror stems from his ability to manipulate deep-seated childhood fears and traumas, exploiting innocence and vulnerability in ways that directly impact human fragility. His ability to morph into whatever his victims fear heightens not only the terror, but also the psychological damage such fear inflicts. In this video, I'll dissect Pennywise's psychology, delve into the societal commentary inherent in his character, explore his form's symbolism and actions, and examine what makes him one of horror's most terrifying yet enduring villains. A key characteristic of Pennywise is his relationship with fear. For him, fear isn't just useful, it fuels him. 
often referred to as it, Pennywise is a cosmic entity whose true form defies human comprehension. His clown disguise, along with various monstrous forms, are mere masks for his actual self, a manifestation of pure existential dread. He thrives on fear, particularly children's, which he claims seasons their flesh. This predatory hunger for terror reflects many real-world predators who feed not only on physical bodies, but also on their victims' emotional trauma and mental distress. From a psychological standpoint, Pennywise resembles a predator that uses psychological warfare as its main tactic. He meticulously selects his victims based on their deepest insecurities and traumas. What makes Pennywise particularly terrifying is his ability to infiltrate the deepest recesses of a person's mind, exposing their most primal fears and using those against them. Whether it's young Eddie Kasprak's fear of disease or Beverly Marsh's terror due to her abusive father, Pennywise doesn't just attack his victims. He systematically breaks them down by turning their own minds against them. The psychology behind Pennywise's strategy highlights broader commentary about fear as a universal human experience. In many ways, Pennywise acts as a mirror to the human condition, reflecting our vulnerabilities and anxieties. He doesn't create fear. He amplifies what already exists, using his victims' internal struggles as fuel for his evil plans. Pennywise's preference for children as his main victims intensifies the psychological horror he represents. Children are naturally more vulnerable both physically and emotionally, with an active imagination that Pennywise exploits to horrifying effect. The idea that something as innocent as a child's imagination can be weaponized against them is deeply unsettling one that hits at the core of what makes Pennywise so terrifying. He corrupts innocence and turns childhood wonder into something grotesque and dangerous, shattering the trust children place in the safety of their world. Understanding the character of Pennywise requires delving into Stephen King's vast universe. Pennywise isn't your typical villain shaped by human experiences or traumas. Instead, he's a cosmic entity that has existed for millions of years. According to King's mythology, Pennywise originates from the macroverse, a realm beyond our physical reality. He came to Earth in prehistoric times and chose Derry, Maine, as his hunting ground. Pennywise's true form is beyond human comprehension and is described in the novel as Deadlights, an undefined, terrifying energy that can drive anyone who looks at it insane. The clown image, along with other disguises Pennywise uses, are simply projections designed to reflect his victim's worst fears. He exists in Derry in a cyclical pattern. He wakes every 27 years to prey on the town's children before returning to hibernation. This recurring pattern gives Pennywise a sense of inevitability. He is not just another villain but an unending force of evil that can never be fully defeated. This cosmic backstory sets Pennywise apart from other horror villains. Many villains stem from human or supernatural origins tied to earthly motivations like revenge or hatred. However, Pennywise's roots are ancient and incomprehensible. His motives aren't about power or dominance in the traditional sense. Instead, they're basic and instinctual, driven by survival and feeding. The aspect of cosmic horror adds an existential dread to his character. He represents a terror that goes beyond physical or psychological limits into metaphysical realms, tapping into fears of the unknown and insignificance of human life in the grand cosmic scheme. At the heart of Pennywise's terror is his clown form. Clowns usually symbolize joy and childhood innocence, but under Pennywise's influence, they become something horrifying. This reversal plays on a deep-seated cultural fear of clowns known as coulrophobia. Clowns have always occupied a strange place in popular culture balancing between comedy and horror. Their exaggerated features and flamboyant costumes often induce unease by hiding the person underneath. Pennywise takes advantage of this uncanny nature by using his clown persona to lure children before revealing his true monstrous form. The choice of clown disguise is significant. It symbolizes deeper fears. Clowns are often linked with circuses, places filled with spectacle and chaos. In contrast, Pennywise turns the circus into a terrifying realm where nothing is as it seems, and even joy becomes something sinister. 
His ability to change forms reflects fear's unpredictability, which can take various shapes and strike from any direction. Aside from his clown disguise, Pennywise's other forms, like a decaying leper or a massive spider, reflect basic human fears. The leper represents decay and disease, playing on Eddie Kasprak's germophobia. The spider form taps into our fear of grotesqueness and the unknown. Spiders, with their alien-like appearance, have long been symbols of the dark side. Pennywise's ability to change forms highlights the ever-changing nature of fear. It is not a fixed emotion, but rather a fluid one that shifts depending on the person and their situation. As a representation of fear, Pennywise signifies this constant flux, always adapting to exploit the weaknesses of his victims. The sinister presence of Pennywise is inextricably connected to the small town of Derry, Maine. Rather than just being a setting, the town itself plays an active role, reflecting Pennywise's evil influence. Evil resides beneath Derry's calm facade, and its citizens have unknowingly become part of this unfolding horror. One particularly unsettling trait of Pennywise is his ability to make Derry's adults dismiss the frequent disappearances and deaths of children. This widespread apathy isn't accidental, but a deliberate outcome of Pennywise's manipulation. He has infected Derry, ensuring that its residents remain oblivious to the horrors happening around them. This situation provides sharp social commentary on how societies can become desensitized to violence and suffering, choosing ignorance over confrontation when dealing with internal evils. In many ways, Derry represents broader societal problems like indifference, complicity, and failure to protect the most vulnerable. The survival of Pennywise and Derry reflects the moral decay within this seemingly peaceful town. The adults' denial of the horrors occurring right under their noses allows Pennywise to continue his reign of terror without resistance. This theme of societal failure is further examined through the Losers Club, a group of kids who eventually confront and defeat Pennywise, representing unity, friendship, and courage in the face of immense evil. These children see past Pennywise's deception while their adult counterparts remain unaware. This contrast highlights that children, with their innocence and honesty, are often more discerning about truths adults consciously overlook. What sets Pennywise apart from other horror movie villains is the way he seamlessly blends cosmic horror with psychological horror. As an entity from another universe, his true nature is beyond human understanding, adding a sense of cosmic dread to his character. But he also preys on his victims' deepest fears and traumas, marking him as a master of psychological horror as well. This dual aspect places Pennywise in a unique position within horror cinema. He poses not only a physical threat, but also an existential one, embodying fear of the unknown, fear of our own minds, and fear of powerful forces beyond human understanding. Pennywise's ability to shapeshift and manipulate fear makes him an unpredictable foe. Unrestricted by any single form or attack method, he continually reinvents himself, ensuring his relevance in a constantly changing genre. This versatility, along with his cosmic origins and psychological depth, distinguishes Pennywise from common slasher or monster cliches immersing audiences in a primal and frightening experience. Pennywise embodies the very nature of fear, his capacity to tap into his victims' deepest fears, combined with his alien origins and shape-shifting abilities, establishes him as one of the most terrifying villains in horror cinema. He goes beyond simple labels like clown or monster. He is an elemental force that feeds on vulnerability and fear at the heart of human existence. Through Pennywise's character, it explores themes of terror, trauma, and societal failures that allow evil to thrive. His reign isn't just supernatural. It reflects humanity's inherent darkness and shows how fear can corrode, destroy, and ultimately consume us. Pennywise's story isn't just about terror. It serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of uncontrolled fear while emphasizing the power of unity against immense evil. As long as there is fear in this world, Pennywise will continue to haunt our nightmares, a harsh reality that the most frightening creatures are often ones we have created on our own. The 1897 novel by Bram Stoker, 
introduced a character that would become a cornerstone of the horror genre, Count Dracula. This figure has fascinated and horrified generations for over a hundred years, embodying the quintessential vampire, alluring yet horrifying, inspiring fear while simultaneously representing humanity's deepest, dark desires. The fascination with Dracula stems from his immortality, bloodlust, and noble bearing, making him an emblem of unbridled power the ultimate predator hiding in society's shadows. This video will delve into the complex nature of Count Dracula. It will investigate his psychology, the societal implications he embodies, and the symbolic layers inherent in his character. We'll explore his origins, historical roots to psychological and supernatural depiction, to unearth what makes him such a formidable force in horror. Central to Dracula's threat is his insatiable need for control. This is evident not only through his thirst for blood, but also through his manipulation of others. He is a figure with immense power, both physical and mental, and this power directly ties with his ability to dominate victims. Unlike other monsters who instill terror through brute force or pure evilness, Dracula's strength lies in subtlety, his ability to manipulate others without them being aware. Dracula's control has an enticing quality. Instead of merely assaulting, he infiltrates victims' minds and bodies. This is particularly seen in his interactions with Lucy Westenra and Mina Harker in Stoker's novel where he slowly saps their vitality, transforming them into extensions of himself. He personifies the archetype predator who patiently stalks prey from shadows until total domination can be achieved. Dracula's vampirism goes beyond predation. It is parasitic. He maintains his immortality by draining the life force of others. This metaphor of parasitism also pertains to how Dracula uses others for his benefit. He isolates victims, cutting them off from loved ones and warping their identities until they belong not to themselves, but to him. This facet of his character reveals a deep psychological need for power and domination over others, not just physically but mentally and emotionally. Beneath this outward display of control and confidence, however, lies an insatiable hunger that can never truly be satisfied. Dracula's immortality serves as both a source of power and a curse. Doomed to eternal life, he forever seeks new victims to sustain himself, trapped in an unending cycle of consumption and decay. His predatory nature, while terrifying, is also pitiful in its relentlessness. Lacking any real joy or satisfaction, his sole purpose is feeding, existing at the expense of others. This relentless hunger taps into a deeper psychological theme, the fear of death and the lengths one will go to avoid it. Dracula conquers death, yet turns into a monster while doing so. His immortality comes at the cost of his humanity. His existence raises questions about the cost of eternal life, whether immortality is a blessing or a curse. Stoker's novel provides little direct information about Dracula's early life. Later adaptations have filled these gaps, often linking him with historical figure Vlad the Impaler, a 15th century Wallachian prince, notorious for brutal warfare methods and governance tactics. The historical Vlad was an unforgiving leader who gained notoriety due to his preferred enemy punishment method, impaling on spikes. His reign was characterized by intense bloodshed, earning him legendary status throughout Europe. By associating Dracula with Vlad, Adaptation suggests the Count's vampirism is an extension of his earthly cruelty. This connection implies that Dracula's monstrous nature was inherent from the start. The concept that Dracula's thirst for blood originated from his days as a tyrannical ruler emphasizes the idea that his vampirism is connected to his insatiable need for dominance and authority. In life, Vlad ruled through fear and violence. In undeath, Dracula achieves similar ends through supernatural abilities. This link between human cruelty and vampirism adds a horror dimension to the character suggesting the monster he became was always lurking beneath his human exterior. While Stoker's original novel doesn't explicitly link Dracula with the historical Vlad, it hints at ancient, dark origins shrouded in mystery. Described as a centuries-old being from a forgotten era, this only enhances his aura of dread. His existence defies natural order, making him terrifying. Whether as Vlad or another dark figure, Dracula's early life reminds us he isn't just a present-day monster, 
but an evil entity whose malevolence spans centuries. The enigmatic figure of Dracula, a character seeped in symbolic significance, serves as an emblem for a multitude of societal concerns. These range from sexual deviance to xenophobia. His capacity to taint the unsullied and precipitate their downfall positions him as an icon of moral degradation, and his very existence poses a threat to societal harmony. Central to Dracula's symbolism is the concept of the other, the interloper who infiltrates society and corrupts it from within. In Stoker's narrative, Dracula is portrayed as an alien from Eastern Europe who ventures into England, a symbol of order, progress, and modernity. The arrival of this foreign entity triggers a wave of disorder as he preys on the English elite, morphing their daughters into vampires and inciting conflict among those who strive to safeguard them. This plotline mirrors Victorian apprehensions about immigration and fears that foreign influences could dilute British values. Dracula's otherworldliness is not merely geographical, it permeates his very essence. He is depicted as a creature that defies natural laws, one who should be deceased but continues to exist among the living. His existence challenges nature's laws, making him an emblematic representation of all things unnatural. Stoker penned his novel during the Victorian era, a period marked by significant scientific advancements yet fraught with trepidation about what these developments might imply for humanity's role in the world. As a character that transcends mortality, Dracula taps into these anxieties, fears that scientific advancement may yield unforeseen repercussions or that man's attempts at mastering nature could inadvertently birth monsters. Sexual transgression is another theme encapsulated in Dracula's symbolism. His assaults on women, notably Lucy and Mina, are imbued with sexual undertones. His act of biting or penetrating the skin to draw blood is a metaphor for sexual violation. The victims often experience a blend of fear and pleasure during these attacks, suggesting an unnerving allure toward the Count's power. This dichotomy, pleasure and pain, fear and desire, echoes Victorian apprehensions about unbridled sexuality, particularly that of women. Dracula embodies the seductive peril of sexual liberation, a force capable of corrupting and destroying if not restrained. The Count's ability to convert his victims into vampires also carries symbolic implications. Once bitten, they morph into beings like him, immortal entities severed from the natural cycle of life and death. This transformation can be interpreted as a metaphor for lost innocence. Those who fall prey to Dracula are irrevocably altered their purity tainted by his evil. Dracula's ability to disseminate his curse like an epidemic mirrors societal fears about contagions, both literal and figurative. It reflects concerns that moral degradation can spread like a disease, infecting the broader community. Hence, Dracula is more than just a character in Stoker's novel. He is a symbol of societal decay and unnatural forces threatening to destabilize our world. The enduring appeal of Dracula, the epitome of horror, is anchored in his ability to embody a wide range of societal fears. In Bram Stoker's time, Count Dracula represented the foreign invader, the subtle influence of the outsider, and the fear of moral decay. As time has passed, his image has been reshaped to reflect changing societal anxieties. Yet at its heart, his terror remains unchanged. He represents the fear of losing control and being overwhelmed by forces we can neither understand nor resist. Set against Victorian England's backdrop, Dracula's origins from Eastern Europe mirror prevalent xenophobia. The novel was written during a period when Britain was experiencing an influx of immigrants. There was a pervasive fear that these newcomers would disrupt cultural and economic stability and bring disease and moral corruption. Dracula's foreignness outdated customs, and predatory nature play into these fears, making him a symbol of the dangers brought on by outsiders. Dracula's ability to corrupt innocence reflects the concerns of Victorian society about the deterioration of traditional values. The women under his influence, Lucy Westenra being a prime example, transform from respectable society members into vampiric seductresses. Lucy's transformation is particularly telling. She goes from an innocent figure 
to a symbol of desire and death. This shift reflects Victorian unease over female sexuality and beliefs that unregulated sexual freedom could lead to societal collapse. Modern interpretations keep Dracula relevant as he continues to reflect current fears. In an era where concerns about disease spread, globalization anxieties, and erosion of cultural identity are prominent issues, Dracula's image as a corrupting outsider still holds relevance. His ability to transmit his vampiric curse through blood takes on new meanings amidst the aftermath of ongoing pandemic worries. What makes Dracula stand out in the horror genre is his ability to adapt to different times and situations, unlike many other villains who are limited by their specific settings. He has undergone numerous adaptations and reinterpretations, yet his essence remains unchanged. He is simply a creature of power, seduction, and death. Unlike many horror figures who rely on brute force or pure evil to instill fear, Dracula's threat comes from his intellect and ability to manipulate. He isn't a mindless killer, but a strategic predator who carefully chooses victims and bends them to his will using charm and supernatural powers. This makes him more complex and terrifying as his evil isn't just physical violence, but psychological domination. Dracula's immortality further sets him apart from other horror villains. He exists outside of time, a being who has witnessed centuries and can easily adapt to any era. The enduring status of Dracula as one of the most persistent figures in horror speaks about his character complexity. He is more than just a bloodthirsty monster. He symbolizes humanity's darkest aspects reflecting our fears about death, power, and the loss of control. His adaptability across different eras and cultural contexts has kept him relevant over a century, while his psychological depth ensures he will continue haunting future generations' nightmares. The true terror of Dracula lies not in his fangs or bat transformation ability, but in how he personifies our deepest fears. He is a predator targeting the innocent, a symbol of moral corruption, and a reminder that evil can spring from the most unexpected places. As long as humanity continues grappling with these fears, Dracula will remain a figure of horror, an ageless threat looming large over the genre.